Hi. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Dom. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, I typically make bookish content, movie content, and anything else in between because I like to do whatever I want on this channel and tonight's going to be bookish content. For today's video, we are going to go over my favorite reads of the year of 2022. I read a total of 30 books and I've picked out five to be my favorites and I'm going to discuss them what I thought was going to be no particular order, but then I ended up didn't making kind of like a tier list. So I'm going to go from number five down to number one, meaning the best book of the year. Without further ado, let's get started. So at number five, we actually have a children's book, and that is called This is the Rope, A Story of the Great Migration by Jacqueline Woodson. This is actually a reread. I mentioned in a few other videos, I cannot for the life of me remember where and why I read this for the first time. However, I didn't even realize it was a reread until I initially opened the book and was recognizing things, but it was still a really fun read. It still stuck with me out of all, I read a lot of children's books in 2022 to meet that goal. And this was by far my favorite just because of how much it stuck with me. This is basically a generational story. It tells the story of a little girl who, and I want to say to like the 1930s South and who moves her way up to New York. She has a rope and that rope sticks with her, her daughter, and then her grand, I believe it ends with her granddaughter in New York. I'm always down for a good generational story, whether it's about generational trauma or even what this book was about. It was just like a good thing. I loved how this rope metaphorically held this family together. It is truly what bought them as the generations grew, as the as future generations came about, and as the generations moved along. Because again, it starts out in the south of the U.S. and makes its way up to New York. Their narration style of this was extremely poetic, which is why I love this book so much. I could see this as like a spoken word poem, and the artwork really enhanced it too, and that made it great as well. But I don't know, like compared to the other children's books I read, there was just something so like poetic about this, and like I felt like I was reading a poem and not a children's book. Every page started out with the phrase, this is the road and then obviously the narration expanded on what that meant whether it was, it was the rope the grandmother used to jump rope with or it was the rope where someone used to swing and it was basically what the I feel like the poetry and the constant repetition of this is the rope is it's kind of what enhanced that family heirloom vibe to it or just the generational vibe like this is the rope that held the family together and yeah it was just a great read at number four we have a whole series that I'm kind of just going to talk about as one book just because each volume I had a separate rating so I averaged it out to figure out where I wanted to put it in this list, but I am going to be talking about Death Note, the story by Sugumi Oba and art by Takashi Obata. Death Note follows a boy named Light Yagami who is a very bored high schooler until one day he comes across a notebook called the Death Note and he discovers that when you write someone's name in the Death Note, they die of a heart attack unless otherwise specified. Therefore, he takes it upon himself to become the god of a new world and starts killing off criminals and anyone who he believes to be a criminal. And the whole story is basically exploring the psychology of a serial killer, if you think about. It's not the words they would use. And exploring what it truly means to be righteous versus evil. And who among us can truly decide what that means. Now, I went into this manga having already seen the anime. I first watched the anime a about 12 years ago, I want to say, when I was 14. Oh my god, I was 14 almost 12 years ago. And then I rewatched it with a roommate in college. But I still went into this like forgetting a lot, especially near the middle there. So I did feel like in a sense I was going to the story blind. One of the reasons it's in my top reads of the year is just I'm proud of myself for finally finishing it. I did not expect this manga to take all of 2022 to finish. This volume specifically, I started on January 1st, 2022, and I kid you not, I read, because I all of it's the black editions, I read the last 300 pages of volume 6 on December 31st, 2022. Literally took me the whole fucking year. I truly feel like the beginning of Death Note, so this volume and volume 2 of the black editions, can be considered masterpieces. Because you have Light Yagami, who's an incredibly smart kid, and then the main antagonist of the story, L, who is supposed to be the smartest detective in the world, or one of the smartest detectives in the world. And like, oftentimes when stories say that, they kind of just tell you they're really smart. They have a hard time showing that. But the authors did a magnificent job of showing how smart Light and L were. It was a constant like cat and mouse game with these two. I was always on the edge of my seat. These two geniuses were always a step ahead of one another in different ways. Like sometimes L would be one step ahead of Light. More, Actually more often than not he was one step ahead of Light which I thought was incredibly interesting to like 
make your antagonist beat the protagonist like that. But then in other ways, Light was one step ahead of L. And you had to be an incredibly smart person to write these two characters the way these authors did. And it has inspired me to become smart. I don't know if I'll ever achieve this genius, but it is a dream of mine. I will admit the whole series is not a masterpiece to me. The middle really did drag for me. Volume 3 was the hardest for me to get through. But the last three volumes, when Light gets his memories back, that did pick up again because it was, it was nice seeing the old characters. And I am of the unpopular opinion that Nier and Mello aren't as bad as characters. I know a lot of people have a hard time with them because it's basically just L all over again. But I had fun with them. I thought it was a really neat concept seeing two people who are totally different and yet are competing against one another for the same goal. Because for the first two volumes, you're watching people who are totally different fight for opposite goals, competing each other for the opposite goals. But Nier and Mello, the, it's, they have the same one. So that was, a, it was fun. It was like two plots in one. The ending of the story could be a little off. I personally did think they dragged it out a bit, dragged out that big reveal. But it was content. I thought it was a good ending overall. And in fact, the manga actually has a different ending than the anime. I do think the way the anime ended was on a stronger note than the manga. However, like the very last few panels the manga has, I thought were incredibly well done. And it was really cool to see. Another reason I love the story is just the Christian imagery, the Christian references. I'm, I'm always down for a good story with Christian references or biblical references I guess I should be saying just because it's always so fun to see how people interweave that into their stories especially when their protagonist is not a particularly great person and is in fact evil because usually when I see like biblical references you know the main character is a hero blah 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 so I thought the way the authors used it for an, ev an arguably evil character was a cool way to go. And finally I just really liked the moral of the story. The moral of the story to me was that in reality, ooh, my McDonald's is here. The moral being no one has the right to say who can and cannot be righteous. And it's shown multiple different ways throughout the book, like for example with our main character. And if you think about it, Light did have good, I guess I could say loosely, intentions. However, if he considers murdering evil, why is it okay for him to murder? And you see throughout the story multiple times he isn't a particularly good person. And there's also multiple things that challenge his worldview. Even the people that agreed with him, they would do things differently. And yeah, Light's plan was working. However, did people feel safer or were they living in fear? And another character even brings up, he has a different opinion than Light. He thinks his opinion is righteous. So because we're all individuals with our own individual opinions, it's really hard to say whether or not you could choose if someone's evil, if someone's purely evil, if someone's purely good. So moral of the story, the average human has no right to play God and make those decisions for people. And despite, you know, despite my views with the middle of the story and how wishy-washy I feel about like the last quarter of the story, the, all throughout the authors did a good job of showing that moral. And that is why Death Note made it to my top reads of 2022. Building this on another day. Now, moving on to number three, we have almost sure off this, Carrie by Stephen King. This is Stephen King's first novel and is about a girl who was bullied at her high school and she decides to take revenge. One of the biggest things I loved about this book so much was how real all the characters felt. I don't know how Stephen King does it, but his characters, whenever I read the book, I don't feel like I'm reading characters. I feel like I'm reading the lives of real people, and I don't know what, what he does differently than other authors. I think he just does such a good job showing her emotions. Like, I could not help but feel terrible for her throughout this story. I mentioned in my wrap-up video one of my favorite characters in this novel is actually Sue Snell. Not because she's a particularly great person, but she just reminds me of any other teenager. And that's why I think I actually like this book so much because minus Carrie and obviously that really evil guy, everyone else just kind of felt like a typical teenager. Even the school bully, what's her face, Chris. And, and like as much as she wasn't a good person, she still, she just felt real. She felt like an actual human being. Sue Snell, she's not evil, but she's not particularly the greatest person on earth, which is what I feel like most teenagers are. And not just teenagers, but I feel like that's just most people. I know at some point in the book, because this is a mixed media book, some point adult Sue Snell says what everyone's forgetting is that we were just kids. And I feel like that's when the point of this book really hit home to me because that's basically what determined my feelings towards most of these characters and how I ended up feeling the way I felt. Because it's, it's pretty amazing to me that throughout this entire book I just felt so 
bad for Carrie but not in the sense where I'm like oh that sucks and then I move on like there were times where I like genuinely like my chest hurt because of how bad I felt for her and how mean I thought everyone was but then you get to the end when you know Carrie I, a lot of us know the plot of Carrie so you know what I'm most of you probably know what I'm talking about but then you get to the end where she does take her revenge on these people and that's when I started feeling very conflicted because despite how terrible these people were to Carrie I still thought Carrie was taking it too far at this point and that these kids didn't deserve it because again they're kids high school sucks for fucking everyone I mean as long as you're not like a genuinely evil person which again I think most teenagers aren't genuinely evil there's so much room for you to grow like uh, most of my character development happened in college between the ages of 18 to 21 and I'm still going through major character development so that's why I feel like determining how people are when they're in high school is so misguided that's just why I felt so bad because and like but at the same time I don't blame Carrie for being as angry as she was because clearly I mean these kids treated her like fucking garbage so clearly these kids had something coming but again I think Carrie took it too far and the reason that's one of my favorite things about this book too is because when you read what Stephen King has to say about this book he even says you don't particularly like Carrie by the by the end of the book but you still feel bad for her or you still pity her and seeing that that was his point and that's what I ended up gathering from the book I feel like he did his job I also just love when I feel conflicted about characters I always like I just love it when authors can just twist things like that where like as much as I feel bad for someone I do still think you're taking it too far or vice versa where I think you're a terrible person however like I still feel bad for you in this moment I love when authors do that because I think you have to have a certain like talent to be able to do that I think because a lot some people just some people can't get that across I also like how this book essentially started the way it ended the book started with Carrie covered in blood it ends with Carrie covered in blood and I like the religious aspects to it as much as Carrie's mom took it to the extreme and she used religion as a bad way I just love when authors bring in religious themes so that was really fun and I think it's also one of those books where I wish I read it when it came out just because I think this would have been so fascinating to read in the 70s when this was more of like a new concept because yeah this is not the scariest thing I've ever read in 2022 but like hearing my parents talk about it my aunt was telling me about it when I because I was reading it when visiting her she said this movie not the book but the movie scared her so much that like she she was like 18 years old when watching it this the movie scared her so much she couldn't like sleep by herself that night and that's because this was just such a new thing for its time especially with religion and a lot of these concepts I can imagine were kind of newer back then I think I've said everything I have to say about this book so let's move on to number two at number two we have another series that I'm kind of just gonna lump into one book and that is Orange by Ichigo Takano this is about a girl named Naho who receives a letter from her future self telling her to take care of the new kid in class a new kid being Kakaru and this is another manga series that just fucking destroyed me. I spent the entire last chapter of this manga sobbing on my bed and I had to just lay there for like an hour staring at the ceiling contemplating life because of how much this ruined me. I found this manga to be an excellent story of friendship but also an excellent exploration of depression and suicide. And I don't know what I was exactly expecting going into it but at the end of the day I'm still actually kind of shocked that the author didn't romanticize depression. The reveal of Kakaru's depression actually happened fairly early. It wasn't something that you find out to the second to last chapter. And the author also wasn't afraid to show the ugly side of things because that's what depression is a lot of the time. Because throughout the story Kakaru does go through many ups and downs. He doesn't just meet his friends and everything's fine. And I do appreciate that the author wasn't afraid to show that. And the reason I say this story is a beautiful story of friendship is because his friends actually stuck by him during the ugly side. They also kind of had their moments where they were second guessing things but it was just nice to see in a story where the characters came together and they're like you know what he's doing this because something else is going on. Let's help him as much as we can. Let's not pry too much but let's also reach out to him so that he knows that we care. Having said that though, Kakuru wasn't magically healed. Despite knowing his friends were at his side, he still had to work through his issues himself. Which is truly how it works in the real world like your friends can only do so much even if they do stay by your side the whole time but also at the end of the day you need to want to get better and I'm glad I'm glad Kakuru didn't just jump to that like he had to go through some hurdles he had to have a mental breakdown to truly understand 
what he needed to get better. And yes, his friends helped him, but also at the end of the day, he helped himself too. And honestly, I think the most interesting aspect of the story is that the author chose to focus on a boy. I feel like these themes are explored with boys quite enough. I feel like they get, I feel like boys' mental issues do get overlooked. When it comes to like mental issues, mental illnesses, like everyone gets ignored, like including women. Women aren't taken seriously either. But also just seeing, I know, I know this is purely anecdotal, but just seeing like how my own family handles it. Like, personally speaking, I was taken more seriously when I came forward and said I'm struggling with OCD than some of my male cousins were. It does give voice to a group of people who are often ignored and I hope there is one day because like yes the story is aimed for girls but also like if a guy reads this I hope he can read it and know he's not alone if he's struggling with these things because yes this can happen to guys too. And men you guys should be taken as seriously as women are when we come forward with our mental issues. We still have a long way to go for both men and women but I think this story is like a nice step forward because it does read differently than other stories I've read with with these themes with this plot line. And that being said this is a Japanese story and I know I'm kind of reviewing this through like an American lens just because I I know how America handles mental illness more so than how other countries handle it so I, it would be interesting to see how a, the Japanese audience received the story and how they took it in. And yeah, if your book makes me sob throughout the entire last chapter and it makes me sad that I have to put these characters on a shelf and I still miss them to this day even it's been even though it's been months since I finished the book, you did your job. Props to you. I should buy my own copies. These were library books, so I should buy my own copies because like I miss these characters. I kind of just want to like skim through this book again just to revisit them. And finally, at number one, we have Letters to Father Christmas by J.R.R. Tolkien. This book consists of all of the letters that Tolkien wrote in Santa Claus's point of view, and he wrote these letters for his children. One thing I actually adored about this book is this like you would you wouldn't think there's necessarily a plot. And yet there is kind of a subtle one because like when the, the first letter when his first son was only three years old it's basically just saying hi I'm Father Christmas nice to meet you see you next year. But as the story as the book goes on and as his kids got older and as he ha as Tolkien had more children the letters actually get longer and longer and more developed and I don't think that subtle plot was intentional but it was just fun reading it and watching watching Tolkien's mind expand a whole world that like we know of but he was making it his own thing. This edition also has like photocopies of all the original letters, all the original artwork which is gorgeous so that when you open the book that's the first thing you see and these are all the original like papers some of the original drawings that Tolkien made and I could truly see Tolkien's creativity in this because because it was interesting how he would handle real life events he would tell the kids oh you know I don't have a lot of gifts this year because you know there's an avalanche that destroyed all the presents in the present room or he would just straight up say like oh I'm sorry I don't have a lot of money this year so I chose what I thought would be your favorite gifts and then when you read the letter and see what year corresponds to you can make the note it's like oh it's because it was the, the depression so Tolkien and his wife themselves didn't have the money and I think that's just a creative way of telling your kids like we can't give you everything you wanted but no worth thinking of you who knew reading a bunch of letters in Santa Claus's point of view would have their heartbreaking moments because you can kind of tell the way Tolkien would word things you can tell when a kid stopped believing it's always so sad to me when like kids stop believing in Santa Claus I mean like after a while you have to stop believing he's real but also like I don't know to me Christmases were a lot more fun as a kid when I believed in Santa there's just something so magical about it all so it's it's like bittersweet getting to those moments in the book and the last letter was just absolutely heartbreaking for me just because the way the last letters worded you know Priscilla doesn't believe anymore so I guess it was Tolkien's way of saying you know goodbye to the project and after a while you could just because they're so mesmerizing so fun to read you forget it's Tolkien writing and for a while it's like I have to remind myself like oh Father Christmas is not real this is like a grown man named the author of Lord of the Rings writing this. So not only is Tolkien saying goodbye to the project but it's also Father Christmas saying like goodbye to these kids. Hope you remember me because this was really fun and it's just it was just sad. And basically in conclusion the reason this is number one on the list of the best books I read in 2022 this was just the heartwarming and wholesome read I needed because like to be honest the Christmas season was horrible. I did not like this past Christmas season just for a lot of private reasons. And truth be told when I read that last letter and closed the book I actually started sobbing. The reaction I had to closing this book was just a, was a very cathartic cry and I didn't realize how much I needed it until I finally you know took in the deep breath and stopped crying. And I will say despite that cathartic cry, despite like you know the heartbreaking moments of the kids not believing anymore, 
this didn't make me very happy. Like, out of, I think out of all the books I read this year, this made me the happiest, and I'm glad I could end the year on such a strong note. If you want a book to help you reminisce on your childhood Christmas days, this is the book for you, because you will love it. Tolkien. I didn't like Lord of the Rings. I thought it was so boring, but there's something about his writing in this one that just captured me. And that is it for the end of this video. Let me know down below what your favorite book of the year was and what you plan to read on in 2022. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up, comment, subscribe. Y'all know the drill. Without further ado, I'm going to peace out and I'll see you guys later. Ciao, tutti.